Hey class, this is the Greek Review. First, we're going to start off with geographical features. The geographical features that predominate in the Greek Peninsula are first, it's surrounded by sea. It's a very mountainous region. There are no major rivers in Greece. Um, climate is well, it's a mild climate, you know, sort of comfortable. If you take a look at the um, the map, you can see high areas of mountains. There is some plains, and those plains are farmable, but the vast majority of Greek mainland was not farmable, and therefore they had to create colonies. Cities like Athens were very, very dependent on these colonies for their food supply. You can also see the large amount of islands that made up Greece. Now, this is a good example of Greek geography. Take a look at the mountainous region. You can see the coastal region there. Once again, it's still mountainous, very dry, very rocky. Um, a natural harbor, sort of. Um, the effects of the mountains on Greece, they had little farmlands. Villages and towns were separated from each other, and they really couldn't communicate or become united. Mountains covered over three-fourths of the Greek um, mainland, um, mainly because of this mountain range. Re the mountainous regions, they were limited to growing olives, grapes, and grain. They also were farmers and herders. Um, Greece is a very mountainous peninsula. We talked about that. It had a great impact on theirs, on their development. It helped them make a, what's called a seafaring tradition, meaning since they really couldn't um, farm the land, they really couldn't make a living off the land, they turned to the sea. For their, um, for their substance, for their food, for fish, for trade. And they have a great seafaring tradition. And this was one of the impacts of their geography. So let's take a real quick review of their geography. A, extremely mountainous, over three-fourths of the land covered by mountains. B, so it's a peninsula surrounded on all sides, all, on three sides by water. C, the impact of the mountains was their very little farmable land. Um, D, the lack of farmable land led to the decolonization of the Mediterranean region. And when you think about the geography of Greece, just think of how different it is from the other civilizations that we have studied. Now let's talk about Greek religion. Greek religion is polytheistic. What it's trying to do is explain the nature around them as well as their human emotions that they don't understand. Um, like other religions we study, they believe that the afterlife, they're in the afterlife, that people have souls. But for the Greeks, most of the people would end up with Hades, which is really somewhere you didn't want to go. And so they sort of have a negative view of the afterlife. Um, Greeks use oracles to communicate with the gods, much like the Chinese did. Um, People would travel to these oracles just to try to hear messages from the gods. Now, the um, different gods have very, very human-like characteristics. And this is something unusual for what we've studied with ancient religions. Most of the ancient religions we've studied have been um, gods that take some form of animal life, like a part human, part alligator, or or a part jackal, part human. Um, and really, they haven't had human emotions, per se. But the Greek gods are have very much so human emotions. And um, part of this is they were trying to explain their own emotions and trying to get an understand of why they had emotions. They're using these gods to explain the mysteries of human life and um, they believe that their gods were directly involved in human life and that their gods were also partly responsible for the emotions they feel. Um, and one of the terms we learned is, is my favorite term, which I have struggle saying, trouble saying each time we do it, but it's anthropomorph that gods were anthropomorphic, meaning that their gods had human-like characteristics. And... Um, this is important to remember because their gods are essentially, if you look at them, they act like humans, they look like humans, they have human emotions such as love, as hate, as jealousy, as envy, 
And the Greeks were just trying to explain their own emotions through these gods. And it's important for you to understand it and understand the extreme difference in this from what we studied in the past. Um, you know, a lot of the gods we studied in the past mainly were controlling natural elements. And Greek gods controlled natural elements too. But not only did Greek gods control natural elements, they also controlled the human emotion. And this was the big, big difference from what we've studied so far. Um, if you look at the um, Greek gods, they look human. With, with, a, with only with a couple of exceptions. So keep that in mind, and that's what I want you to get from our discussion of Greek religion, is the difference from what we've studied in the past. We're seeing gods now that reflect human beings. In the past, the gods have reflected sometimes the most fierce thing in nature. But in Greece, the gods reflect themselves. They reflect humans. And they have human-like characteristics. And that's the biggest difference from what we've seen in the past with the ancient religions. Now, Greeks did have certain rituals. They would sacrifice animals and whatnot to their gods. They had priests. Um, a lot of times the priests would consult with rulers before action was taken. And this is similar to other religions. We talk, For instance, we talked about both Egypt and China who used oracles to help make decisions. And um, so there are also very much similarities between the, Greek, between the Greek gods and the other ancient gods that we have studied. Two things characterize Greek art, art and architecture. First, Greek art. Um, realism and idealism. The realism part of Greek art is the, how it imitates the um, human body relatively quickly and accurately. If you take a look at the picture now, it's called the discus the discus thrower. And, um, you you know, the idealistic part of this statue, or the idealism in the statue, is that it's it represents what the Greek consider to be the perfect form of the body. And like I said in class, if you believe all the Greek statues you see, every Greek has six-pack abs, but that's not the case. That's the ideal body form. Um, also, now let's go about the realism in the statue. You can see how the calf muscles flex how the muscle in his arm flex, and that's extremely realistic. They had a great work and knowledge of the human body and how it works, and this is reflected in their art. It's extremely realistic in the movement of the bodies. Um, though it's not realistic in the terms that every Greek looked like this, but in the way it represents the body, it's more realistic than any other form of art than we have seen to date. Now, the next statue we'll be taking a look at is the statue of Nike. And the statue of Nike is perhaps the best, let's say, the best view of what a realistic work of art should look like. Um, if you take a look at the statue of Nike, one of the most realistic elements of it is the way her dress is getting ready to take flight. Her wings are back, but her dress is pushed up against the body, pushed back against the body, as if she is preparing to take off, or getting a lot of, you know, preparing to take off, running, getting a lot of speed, and um, you can see the dress is pushed so much up against her, you can even see her belly button. And, you know, it's interesting to note that the Greeks had this kind of realism in their art that we have not seen nowhere else. And, um... The next statue you're taking a look at is called the Fallen Soldier. Take a look at the guy's face. You can actually see some form of emotion there. Um, you can also see as he's leaning his arm up against the shield, the flexion of the muscle. The Fallen Soldier is actually a little earlier piece of art than um, the discus thrower, but you can see the beginning of the realistic impression, the realistic aspect of the um, Greek art. And it's interesting to note, like I said, that two major components of Greek art, realism, idealism, that we do not see anywhere else. Moving from art to architecture, what you see in front of you is the Parthenon. Um, notice the distinctive feature is the um, columns. 
And you remember there are three types of columns. You have Corinthian style, which is the most fancy. You have the Dorian style, which is the most plain. And the Ionian style, which is sort of in the middle. It's sort of not too fancy, but more than the Dorian. Um, the Parthenon was one of the major Greek architectural structures of the time. Part of it still stands now. It's made of marble as well as stone. The second Greek feature you'll be seeing next is the as an amphitheater. And I put this up here just to show you where many of the Greek plays took place. A lot of these amphitheaters were outdoor built on the side of hills. They generally have stone seating and an open area for acting on the bottom. Um, in summation, remember we talked about the idealism and the... Uh, the idealism and the Lord have mercy, I'm forgetting my, my place here. The idealism and realism of the Greek art and um, architecture for Greece is determined by the, um, the, the some of the styles of Greek columns. And here at the end, the last slide, you'll see some of the important um, features of Greek architecture just so you can take have them for reference. Hey now let's talk a little bit about the Dark Age. The Dark Age is the area when um, Greece was invaded by the Dorians. Now prior to the Dorians the Messians ruled the area. The Messians were kind of a per peaceful people but they were um, they had Bronze Age technology, so they didn't really stand too much of a chance against the Dorians. Now, before the Messians were there, they were the Minoans. And you remember the Minoans were the ones that liked the bull jumping. And, um, well, what happened was this. The Messians were in charge. Um, the big bad Dorians come in. The Dorians pretty much sent everybody into the Dark Ages. They conquered the area. Economy stops. Writing stops. Literature stops. Um, come, literally, contact with the outside war, world stops, and um, the Dorians eventually settle down and form a town called, or a city called Sparta. Now, the people who resist the Dorians, the Ionians, settle down and they eventually form Athens. Well, after this Dark Ages comes the Archaic period. And gradually, Greece woke up from the Dark Ages. They started settling, settling in Acropolises. Eventually, the Acropolises, which are basically a defensible hill, turned into the first polises, or city-states. Um, it was during the Archaic period that the city-states started to rise. The first Olympic Games were held. They started colonizing different areas, um, Turkey, Sicily, as well as Italy. They started with their sea-based trade. They're, they reasserted themselves as a seafaring people. And so during the Archaic period, things started popping back up. Literature, Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey about the Trojan War. Things started looking back up during the Archaic period. city states started to form, like I said. And Greece started to look like Greece. Now, toward the end of the... Um, the Archaic period came the Classical period. Now, what starts off the Classical period, really, was the Persian Wars. The Persian Wars has two predominant con consequences. The first consequence of the Persian War was the rise of Athens as a political as well as a military power. Um, if you remember, the first Persian War was largely defeated by Athens, um, the Second Persian War, the Sparta helped at the Battle of Thermopylae, but they eventually didn't contribute much. Uh, Athens was destroyed during the Second Persian War, but Athens ended up leading Greece again to victory. After that, during the Classical Age, Athens formed a Delian League, which was supposed to protect against Persian invasion, but it ended up turning into an Athenian Empire. Now, Athens being Ionian, you know, which was the opposite of Sparta, the Dorians, this worried, this Athenian Empire, this Delian League, worried the Dorians, so they formed the Peloponnesian League, which set the place up for the Peloponnesian Wars. 
And really, when you look at the Peloponnesian War, it lasted around but just about 40 years or so, 47 years, and 37, 44 years. And essentially what happened was that Greece drained itself of its power. They fall eventually, Athens was defeated by the um, Spartans with the help of Persia. But it really wasn't much of a big victory because after that, both Athens, Sparta, as well as most of Greece, didn't have the power that it used to, didn't have the manpower that it used to, and gradually their power and status declined and they were taken over by Macedonia. Macedonia was by King Philip. King Philip came in, took over, took over all of Greece, ended the age of the city-states because they were no longer independent, they were subject to his rule. Now, um, King Philip was assassinated, and with his assassination came Alexander the Great, who conquered the then-known world, basically, Middle East, all the way up to Persia. Now, Alexander the Great was a great, great military leader, but he, could, he wasn't a very good organizer. And so, he fought his way all the way to Persia. Now, as we talked about Greek culture before, Greek culture is very, they say, I don't know, eccentric, meaning they um, think everybody outside of them is barbarians. And even during the age of Alexander, they thought this. And so as he kept conquering these areas and incorporating different troops and incorporating different peoples into the empire, Athenians actually didn't like this. So as Alexander got ready to go into India, his troops rebelled against them. Basically, they wanted to go home. And they also rebelled against adding Persians to their army. And so Alexander was having problems, but he didn't get to see too much of these many more problems because he was eventually died of malaria, which was caused by the mosquito bite. After his death, the Hellenistic Age occurred. And basically, this is, um, Hellenistic Age begins with the death of Alexander the Great. And it's basically when the, his empire divides into two, three separate parts. The Antigon, which is basically Greece. The um, Suclid, which is the Persian area. And the Pontomiac, which is the Egyptian area. This period was a period of great cultural expansion for Greece. Greece was spread across the known, Greek language, Greek language was spread across the known world. Um, great scientific achievement. Um, the Suclid Empire was, of, the, of the three was the richest. The Pontomiac was probably the second richest, but the most stable. While the Antigal part of the empire was just sort of just there. It was Greece. And they, they sort of fought among each other a lot of times. And um, these three different areas contributed so much scientific knowledge, so much new knowledge that we thought were actually originally thought it was founded first during the Middle Ages, but actually it was founded first during this area, during the Hellenistic period, particularly in Alexandria. Um, in Alexandria, Egypt, was like the center of learning for the world. There they had cut, they had um, discovered about the Earth, the, the Earth being round, the solar system's planets and their orbits. They discovered all that back then, but it was lost, and it had to be rediscovered much, much later. So the Hellenistic period is characterized basically by the spread of Greek culture, a great amount of cultural diffusion from Greece all over the area, and basically the breakup of Alexander's empire. And the final stage we're going to take a look at, which I didn't put a slide up, up here for, is the um, Roman conquest of the Roman period. And with the Roman period, basically the Romans came in. They got involved in two times. The first time they got involved, they invaded. And they didn't do too much with Greece. They just tell them to be good. They didn't annex any land. They made them pay a fee. But Greeks do what Greeks do. And they kept fighting. So the, the Romans came in the second time and took over Greece as a whole. And after that point, Greece was never a world power on the ancient stage. Now let's take a look at the type of governments you often see. The most common governments you see in Greece um, the first, all Greeks at some point had a monarchy. Um, but one city-state in particular maintained a monarchy through this about the whole Greek period, and that was Corinth. You know, then the second type of government you often see was the oligarchy, and that was particularly represented by Sparta. 
Sparta being, the, you know, with two kings. Not only did it have two kings, it had a council of 28 and so forth. Then you have a democracy, which was a direct democracy in Athens. And these are the predominantly government types you see. Now, from time to time, a tyranny would arise. And a tyranny is a period of illegal rule. It's not necessarily bad, but um, it was a period of illegal rule. And so I just wanted to review these real quick with you. Now, since I had to review, this is just a quick little matching thing, which you should be able to do. And um, basically you match what type of government goes with what city, state, and the description. And I didn't want you know, so make sure you take a look at that and you can able to match the type of government with the city state that is belonged as well as the definition or description. Now what we're gonna be talking about is the Greek economy. And um ancient Greek was characterized by basically it, Important the first really import export based economy. They had coinage, which is currency, but you know they were you know made of gold and coin, gold and silver usually, but they were usually um, varied by the way they looked from city state to city state. And some city states would exchange other coins for theirs for a certain exchange rate and make money off the exchange. Greek trade extended throughout the region. If you take a look at the current map, this is Greek trade during the Hellenistic route. You can see why the Sucleid Empire, which is in the green, was so wealthy because that little red line going through the green area is the Silk Road. You can also see there was extensive trade through the Pontomiac region, which is Egypt, and that's one reason why Egypt was such a stable as well as such a um, wealthy empire. Notice the area that had very little trade, which was the Antigon region, the original Greece region. The shift of trade as well as culture had moved from Greece to both the Egyptian or to the Pontomiac and the Sucleid sections of the empire. But trade was still trade and during this period the Hellenistic region it's interesting to note that they are still trade dependent. They are very export orientated economy and you can see basically what was traded in the little orange areas above. Um, Greece has always been an export import related. You can see here how they traded with their colonies. The gray areas are the Greek colonies. The Greek colonies generally provided food for the mainland, in particular Athens, which was desperately lacking in the amount of food they had. Um, and so uh, this is an interesting map because you can see the extent of Greek influence through trade throughout the region and through the establishment of colonies. Um, they were two types of trade, guys. Now, they had some local trades, and this was trades between the different Greek city-states. Sometimes it would amount to crops. A lot of times it amounted to porcelain or to... Um, you know, different crafts. The Greeks generally met in a place called Agora, A-G-O-R-A, -A, which is a market. This is where they done their trading. This is also where they would meet sometimes for political decisions and to discuss things. Um, one thing um, we should mention was this definition of trade, and I put that at the top. Basically, it consists of exchanging or buying products. And I just want to make sure you understand what trade is, because we talk about trade a lot, but I don't know if we, you, some of you guys actually understand the concept of trade. And this is essentially exchanging or buying of, of products. And the exchange can be, a say, a barter exchange, or it can be a purchase with money. Long-distance trade is called exports and imports. And merchants would ship products overseas, and in return they would... They would even receive money or other products that they could sell in their polis. Generally, each they use silver coins in Greece, and um, these are the you know like their money they used they used to exchange things with. Um, and so it's interesting, like I said, to note just how modern their economy was. It was an export import based economy, and um, and that is getting more and more. 
And also don't forget, this trade was financed by banks making high interest loans. And this is new. And also do not forget, as we talked about in class, that um, trade was competed for by different city-states. The city-states would offer incentives to try to get different people to you know to trade with them. Now, the Greek economy essentially had five different areas. They had trade, of course. They had fishing, melagory, melagory, I can't say that word again. But that is um, simply making metal, steel, I mean, iron, bronze, and whatnot, and a craft market, as well as agriculture. Those five areas made up the Greek economy. And like I said, trade being the very, very biggest part of that with agriculture being a little bit smaller and fishing being predominantly a local thing. The social network of Athens is relished of Athens. It's hard to talk about the social network as a whole. We're going to fo focus on the social network of Athens since it's a democracy. They had an upper class, which are the citizens. Then they had a, a secondary class called the metics, a lower class called the freedom, and the slaves on the bottom. The citizens are those people who were born in Athens and who were, are essentially Athenians. Metics are, people, metics are people who generally come to Athens to work. They settle down. They make money. But they cannot be a citizen. They cannot vote. Freedmen are those who were former slaves who were freed. And um, the slaves, of course, on the bottom. Where do women fit on that? In Athens, women don't even fit on the social scales. Most of the time, a woman cannot come outside the home without being escorted by a man. Um, and, and so they are, in the Athens scheme of life, they were probably the lowest uh, as any civilized women were probably on the lower of the social scale as any other civilization that we have studied at this point. Um, and so also tied in with this concept of social structure was the idea of citizenship. There are only people that could be citizens were on the top layer, the true born Athenians. They were the only group that had that voting right. So in Athens more than most political rights and social structure was interchanged because if you think of their social structure it's not really job based it's based on basically where you were born you were born in Athens or you won't that's highly different from anything else we've seen and make sure you remember that because it's highly different to be to have political power in Athens you had to be born in Athens you had to have Athenian parents if you were a medic even if you were a successful medic who traded you didn't have political power. You could not vote. And that's important. Real quick, let's take a look at the Spartan, <coughs> the Spartan social structure. Um, to be, you know, basically a, you know, a full citizen of Sparta, like in Athens, you had to be born or, or in there, this case, is adopted by a Spartan family. Um, if you were a citizen like in Athens, you could hold office and have political power. But like Athens, if you were not a citizen, you were classified had, um, as a perioeci, P-E-R-I-O-E-C-I. -E -E and this is, like, this is comparable to the metic group in Athens in that you had no political power. You had some legal protection. You could not own land just like the, um, the metics. These people were generally the merchants who came to Sparta to make a living. And they had very little, or they had no political power. They also, in the Spartan social structure, had slaves. They were called helots. And notice in the Spartan structure, they do not have a freedman. Because in Sparta, once you were a slave, you were always a slave. Now, in Sparta, women had a little bit more status. They could um, manage property. They could... Um, they had certain more certain rights. They could, you know, be left property. And the reason for this is that the Spartan men were rarely home. So when you compare the Spartan men to the Athenian, I mean, excuse me, the Athenian women to Spartan women, Spartan women actually had it better. They had more rights and definitely more respect. In conclusion, what I want you to start thinking about is the difference in the U.S. Um, democracy, our democracy, and that of Athens. 
you know, most particular and one of the most striking differences is not only that we are a representative democracy and Athenians in a democracy, I mean, as a direct democracy, but the difference in citizenship, guys. In the U.S., you basically, to be a citizen, you either have to, you can be born into it or you can complete a process. Whereas Athens, you did, the only way you could be a citizen, basically, if you were born of a citizen parents. And that limited who can participate in your democracy. That limited a lot. You know, and uh, a democracy is defined, really, by the... How much, blah, 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 how much citizen participation it has. And so when you take a look at our democracy versus Athenian, even though sometimes you hear Athenian democracy being held high, it's actually a lot more restricted than the United States democracy in terms of citizenship. They both had three branches of government. Um, we, like I said, but we have an elected president. They would basically have a council of 500 who would act as the executor. Um, we both had juries, but our juries were consisted of 12. They had an unlimited number of journey, juries, or jurors, I should say. Um, everything is chosen by lot, which is basically laws are passed by lot. By, by lot means by everybody voting. Um, the councils are selected by lot, but we, you know, we elect officials to elect and vote on laws for us. So what I want you to do is start thinking about the differences in our governments and be able to discuss that with me when you come in for your review because this is something that you should be able to sit down at home between the resources and the line binder, the previous exercise you have committed in class that you should be able to do by this point. And further, guys, I wish you the best of luck on the test. There may be one more video coming out back on the Peloponnesian Wars if I have the chance to make it. Otherwise, I've talked about it. Good luck. If you need anything, please ask. And um, don't forget, your NHD is not is not as due ever so closely. And um, take care. Good luck.